Hello everybody, we just waiting uh, three more minutes, three more people uh, uh, connect or arrive here at the room. researcher at the Smithsonian and also visiting researcher at the Australian Institute of Marine Sciences. So today, I mean, I circulated his CV if you're interested. In. He has uh, over 100 publications uh, in many and book chapters. And today he's going to talk to us about the new normal for Caribbean coral reefs. Uh, are the Gorgonians taking over? Right. He was also the editor of coral reefs. Yes. 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 I apologize to anyone who feels that he's at that point in time. The manuscripts were rejected during that tenure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was my associate that I had. <laughs> okay, um, well, yeah, title speaks for, speaks for itself. And uh, actually, this is sort of a, a variant on a talk I gave actually in in Buffalo a, a couple of weeks ago. And, as, and because at that point the weather was beginning to turn, I said, you know, 
Oh, wait. The other one. Yeah. I said, oh, you know, at this time, as the, as the weather in the north turns bad, everybody starts thinking that, oh, wouldn't it be nice to go to the tropics? And of course, this is, this is the image that, that, that comes to mind, you know, and, and, and then, of course, this is what everybody expects to see when they when they go to the tropics and, say, and see a coral reef. And, and you know, and, and I think probably everybody in this room, in talking to somebody or giving a talk, is you know, you know, the the mantra of you know, coral reefs are one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. And if you're talking to people who aren't accustomed to you know the marine world, you say they're you know akin to to tropical rainforests in terms of their their bio, their biodiversity, and 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 like the rainforest, what you know, it characterizes all these systems. Is not only is it all the biodiversity, but in structurally complex environments that are built by the organisms that inhabit inhabit that environment. Now, something to you know keep in mind, just sort of sort of broad perspective. I mean, we sort of think of reefs as special places, which they are, but they been around really all of geologic history. So, you know, what you're, well, I'll just work backwards in time. Since, you know, so here, this is in uh, San Salvador in the Bahamas, and this is a place to see it now, you know, during the high stand 114,000 years ago. Um, it looks just like the modern reef. Here's a cartoon of a modern reef, but this audience will quickly realize, no, that's not correct. <laughs> There's a tridactic there. We are going I mean, to talk about... But you go the... back to, you know, to the Permian, and you basically have these huge, you know, this is all, this is all reef. This is all limestone built up by reef, and it, it, the structure was very different. It was sponges and, and rhizoans, and you go back to the Devonian, and you're actually back to a mix of, of, of corals and sponges, these stromatoporoids and, and, and tabulates. And here's this feature in Australia where you're looking at the reef edge. And you go around there, you can see places where it's clear spurring groove. You know, so reefs, reefs have really always been there. And, and basically, you know, you get a reef anytime you have a, a tropical ocean, shallow, warm waters, um, and rising sea levels in terms of building up, allowing the reef to build up. And then you add to that the organisms which will you know, create the structure, um, produce sediment that's going to fill in the structure as it grows and bind, and bind things together. And you end up with this, this huge array of, of different reefs. And just to, again, to get that sense of, yeah, reefs have been around forever. Reefs that sort of are similar to the reefs that we're accustomed to go all the way back to the, to the Ordovician. And if you want to include things that are a little more the phrase would be bioherms, just piles of, of organisms. It goes all the, all the way back to the Cambrian. And if you want to include these sort of algal assembled areas, it goes it goes back into the into the pre-Cambrian, into the Proterozoic. So, you know, as as special as we think reefs are, it's almost they're almost an inevitable outcome if you have organisms in warm water. Of course, the modern reefs are dominated by by well. Mon reefs historically have been dominated by scleractinians, which you know are the structure builders. They they are the organisms that have allow reefs to, to grow up to keep up with rising sea levels and, 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 and the like. But when you look even at a quote healthy modern reef or you know a reef from 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, scleractinians were not the only organisms around. So here you have you know lots of gorgonians and there's some sponges scattered in here. So there have always been other organisms mixed in, in into these environments. And, you know, this is actually, so this is sort of, for, for, for those of you not fully acquainted with octocorals, um, you know, it's really, you're fully acquainted with scleractinians. It's pretty pretty darn similar, except that now they're octocorals, so you have eight tentacles and, and only eight, not the multiples of six that uh, you find in, with the scleractinians. And, um, you know, the life cycle in terms of, of reproductive biology, you have species that broadcast spawn, species that uh, do this called surface brooding, where the eggs are extruded, they just sit there and bound to the colony with a little mucus, develop there and then sort of get washed off. And then there are a relatively small number of species, or smaller number of species that are brooders. Although I hesitate when I said small number because there's just so many species, you know, 
fully know their reproductive cycle. It may turn out that more than we thought. And in all cases, those develop into a planular larvae. That larva settles, metamorphoses into these nice little polyps, unless, of course, you're searching for them where they're small and hard to find. Um, they start replicating, building a branch, and then you know going on to the colony. And as at least everybody in this room is, is well acquainted, you know that you have this whole a whole diversity of forms that can be formed, and you know within the sort of on the extreme side of how do they do that? Of course, are the um, fans where you know you have these anastomosing branches, which is you know in terms of those, how do they do that? <laughs> Questions so, are something we'd love to spend time sorting out. So, as I said, you know there these animals. In modern reefs or historically modern reefs that have, are you know clearly there, and we don't know a whole lot about how long they've been there, but it's likely that the, it's, it's highly likely that they have been. We don't have a lot of evidence because, of course, the axis of these Gorgonians is is proteinaceous, and, and therefore it means it doesn't preserve very well at all. Sometimes the holdfast is secondarily calcified. And there actually are some cases where that's found in, in, in the fossil record. I'll show you a picture of that in a, in a moment. And then the other potentially fossil material are these sclerites, so these, these um, high, high magnesium calcite molecules <coughs> that are found in the colonies. And the and, you know, sort of one of the reasons we know so little about Gorgonians in general is the fact that they're tough to identify and the species level identification starts comparing you know bumps and squiggles on the size of the, uh, of the uh, these things and sort of going oh is this one a little more complex than that one and you have uh, varieties of different shapes and different and different species um but these are high magnesium calcite which just easily dissolves it's the, and therefore it's also not in the fossil record but we do have some and, you know so here's a you know pleistocene um from costa rica of a holdfast, some holdfasts from the Ligocene um, in, in Mississippi, and then actually some sclerites that came out of, out of those formations. So we know even though you know we, we have abundant scleractinians from all these ages, we don't we, we just have the indication that, that octocorals were probably also present. And this is going back to that Pleistocene reef. So this is 114,000 years ago, mm -hmm. and embedded in the matrix, here's a cyphoma. Which only feed on the Gorgonians, so yeah, they had to be Gorgonians there as well. And so we can assume that this community that we see now, which we know has been pretty stable for the last hundred thousand, or this community that existed up until about fifty years ago, this has been um, it's pretty stable for the last you know, hundred thousand years or so. And you know, so again, lots of places which are you know we look across. A whole array of habitats, sure, places which are just, it's all scleractinian, but historically there have also been places which, you know, that are this mix, and even places which are dominated by, by octocorals, by Gorgonians. But as we know, um, scleractinians are the framework builders, they're the organisms that, you know, build, build up the reef, and, and they have not done all that well over time, and this is the figure that probably most of you have seen a thousand times before from this uh, Gardner pa et al. paper showing how in the Caribbean, you know, places went from, you know, say on an average 50% cover to here that, you know, turn of the century, you know, down, down around 10% and pretty much everywhere that's not dropped to zero, but it's, you know, down to 10% and lower in places. And you know, and, and the, the pictures that, you know, kept getting, keep getting shown. So Discovery Bay, the highlight, height of Discovery Bay is the, the mecca for coral reef biologists in, in the 70s. You know, there's a cropper cervicornis, and now just sort of this mix of some sponge and some octocoral, and there probably are a few pieces of coral embedded in that, but not, not much. Carries Fort Reef in 1975, if people were going to the Keys, oh, this is the place to go diving. And then by 2000, well, basically white band disease swept through in, in, the, in the 1980s, um, wipes all of this out, and that structure has just collapsed down to this rock 
co covered with you know some some turf by by and large. So really the, the you know the question in in the long run is okay if this is the formula for building a reef what happens when you don't have those those framework builders and that's you know the because the um, you know people have talked regardless of what other organisms are, are present and this is sort of in the background for you know I'd say thinking about the world in the future about this flattening of the reef you know always when I just saw that carry sports slide where what's left of the carbonate slowly and steadily erodes erodes away but it's not simply like reefs are gone so here's here's the the way people have characterized it so this is Terry Hughes's work from from Jamaica showing how Coral coverage is steadily, and so this time scale is 75, 1975 to 1995. How coral cover steadily declined, and you know algal cover steadily increased. And you know we can have long discussions of which is the chicken and which is the egg in this. In, in, in this, but the point being, there's this concomitant change in, the, in their abundances. And the way this has generally been characterized is. And, and this is taken out of a, a, a paper in Science last year. Um, you know, here's the classic, um, you know, ma mathematical model for the, this sort of system, where well, they have improving environmental conditions as the environmental conditions degrade, the system keeps degrading. And here I'm just putting coral cover as our you know, measure of ecosystem health, and you hit this quote tipping point, and the system crashes. And the important thing in terms of talking about reef recovery is that people characterize these systems as having hysteresis. That is to say, once you're here, you can't simply go back up the curve. You have to go all the way back to essentially it tips again, going, going the other direction. And obviously this is not a happy scenario for, for the future, for the future of reefs. But at the same time as this has always been characterized as it's Coral cover versus algal cover. That's not the only endpoint in this in the system. So here's this graph out of this now getting pretty old Nordstrom paper, which shows, hey, here are a whole bunch of places throughout the world where the sclerotinians have really decreased in numbers, and other species have dramatically increased in, in numbers. And I didn't realize it until I sort of had blown up and noticed it that amazingly enough, the Arabian Peninsula is host to a <laughs> to corallobotharians. I think we can assume that's a Red Sea location. But the, the po important point being that there are places where it just doesn't play out as it's coral or it's algae. And you know this, this transition that has it has occurred in some places, and now obviously I'm going to be talking about octocorals, is really well illustrated. These are these pictures from uh, Gene Shin. And actually, if you go to this USGS site, there are a number is a number of, of of these uh, locations where he just went out well, every so often, every decade, every so often, picture in the exact same place. And so here's 1961, here's, here's this uh, nice orbicella just sort of sitting there. 1976, copper server cornice is overgrowing. 1980, it's beginning to die back. 1988, it's pretty much gone, but the orbicella's hanging in there. And now in 1992, oh yeah, here's you know some fans, some some Gorgonians appearing. 1998 now, there are all these Intilogorgia that have come in, and that's pretty much stable for the, the rest of this for the rest of this sequence. And then also staying in the, in the Florida Keys, Molasses Reef, this uh, Rizika study, where here is in 2001, obviously sclerotinians are long, long gone out of, out of this picture. And in 2009, you can see how this space is now filled in with Gorgonians, Conch Reef, um, which is the site of Aquarius winter. Um, 2001, not a whole lot going on. 2009, a whole bunch of, of octocorals. And the, the numbers that go with this are now, we're starting this 1996 through 20, about uh, 2009, scleractinian cover is already at this abysmal lo low level, and it drops down through the, the latter part of the 20th century, and basically is sort of hung in there at this 
you know, really anemic looking level. Um, Octocorals, interesting, they're also doing this decline, but then see they steadily increase with maybe a drop here, which is probably associated with a leaching, leaching event, but they seem to be on, on the rise. And then this is a Juan Sanchez's data. Um, so I'm two, two sites in the uh, Colombian Caribbean, um, and basically one site, 2003 coral, octocoral cover, 2015, it's big growth, but it's not a uniform, you know, the other site, there's really no, no change between the two. So this change over that has occurred is something that's not been absolutely everywhere, but where, where people actually have data on octocoral cover, which unfortunately is not a lot of places, it seems to be a fairly common result. Um, so uh, Pete Ed Edmonds um, brought me in to help help work with him in the in the Virgin Islands uh, starting about eight years ago, but Pete's been working there for like 30 years. And these are some of, the, of, of his data from uh, these these nine randomly selected sites, which shows, you know, through this this time period, octocoral cover is, I mean, scleractinian cover is just hideously low. It bounces around. There's some hurricane event, hurricane H hurricane he is bleaching. There's some hurricane and bleaching effects, but not a whole lot. Like the keys, octocorals sort of do this decline in the latter part of the 20th century, but then they've been steadily building. Um, but every site sort of has its own special story. So here's this, this one site um, over a longer time span. And, and, and this is, you know, in some ways, this would be the poster child for saying octocorals and scleractinians trade off because here we have scleractinians are increasing and the octocorals are declining and then the scleractinians decline and the octocorals are, are increasing. Um, so yeah, oh yeah, great. This is, you know, you can decide whether you want to call it competition or octocorals moving in after the scleractinians die. But then you go to another site, which is like a kilometer away, half, half a kilometer away, and now both octocorals corals and scleractinians are nose diving, and then scleractinians stay stuck down here, and the octocorals come come back. But you know, so um, to answer a question which almost inevitably gets asked is, so what was going on here with the octocorals? And I don't know. I haven't a clue. <laughs> um, I wish, you know, I wish I did, but um, yeah, both octocorals and scleractinians were throughout the latter, you know, you have Florida Keys, you have, you have St. St. John, they were steadily, they were both steadily declining, but at least this century, octocorals have generally done well. So, you know, we have this, if this is, an, and this is a, a site in St. John, um, before Maria, which would have knocked over this dendrogyra, before sudden coral tissue loss disease, which would have killed the knocked over dendrogyra, um, and Irma uh, and Maria both ripped up some of the some of the octocorals here. But you know we, we have, and, and actually you folk are really familiar with these octocoral forests. If, and this, the question is: Is this the new normal? Is this what we can expect to see now for you know for quote time immemorial? So I'm going to come back to this. To this model, and you know, this is you know, and this is we all at some point take our you know sort of theoretical ecology course or that section in, a, in, a, in your advanced ecology course, which you know teaches these these models, and they're all built around homogeneous ecosystems. And and this paper that 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 um, Reed Kirk had all published last year says, and, th and they were working in uh, grasslands. And they said, these are not homogeneous systems. They're highly heterogeneous systems, and we see different organisms in different places, and those patterns change. And we need a model that takes that heterogeneity into account. And when they do that, what they discovered is you don't have tipping points. What you can have, I'm not sure how you pronounce that correctly, bus, bussy fluid. This, this, where basically you can have sort of a quasi-stability until things go bad, and then they dip, and then you get some little more quasi-stability. Obviously, eventually things go bad enough, you end up down here. And the other interesting thing about this type of system is it doesn't exhibit hysteresis. It is possible to ride 
back up. And you know, I'm not suggesting a, a formal test of this model in, 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 reef, in, in reef systems, but it, it would, it's sort of tempting to sort of say, well, is what we see when we look around, or, you know, are octocorals sort of this quasi stable state where they're gonna, they can persist over quite a range of conditions, and but if things go bad enough, you're still gonna end up down there. Um, they said that's not something I'm formally testing, but it's, I mean, I think it's, you know, the recognition that the world isn't that simple tipping point system is, I think, the important point. So again, scleractinian dominated world, octocoral dominated world. Um, so if they're the new normal, and I, and I added on some reefs actually this morning as I was thinking about this, because um, as people here know, there are places that have always been octocoral dominated. So, but if they're the new normal, at least on some reefs, and I think we can ask why that is, and really at some point we have to address why some reefs have always had lots of octocorals. And I relate this, and this is to a, a generally speaking, that octocorals are resistant to the sort of slings and arrows that are being thrown against them, and, and, and so that scaracanines aren't, that on the colony level and on the population level, they're way more resilient, and also that as scaracanines have died out, there's this increase in habitat availability. So resistance, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind, bleaching, you know, these, these wonderful images, or actually got horrific images, but <laughs> great graphics showing how, you know, healthy reef, bleached reef, dead reef, obviously, in the you know, Pacific. And here's just a listing of, and this is, and Ernesto can um, add many species, I suspect, to this, to this list, but here of the and I say approximately 65, because obviously the systematics are always changing, but of the approximately 65 Sclerotinian species, 38 of them in this, in this compilation are known to bleach, and I put in, in, in yellow those species which are, at least in some, some localities, particularly important members of the community, either because they're you know, super abundant or they're really important framework, framework builders. So a lot of important corals, Sclerotinians, bleach, and suffer mortality as, as a result. Octocorals, it's a lower proportion. There are octocorals that bleach, but dying from bleaching is more the exception than the rule in the octocorals. There are uh, Plexurellas tend to, tend to bleach and, and die. Priarium can bleach and die, but uh, most of these species seem to bleach and then, and then recover. So they seem to be just this very sort of, look up a few lists, um, more resistant, octocorals being more resistant than scleractinians to, to bleaching. And then there's this diseases. So here's this compilation from 2004. So here's scleractinians and a whole variety of different, of different diseases or conditions, I'll, I'll call it. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of them subject to disease. And, and some of these diseases are things that wax and, and the boys waxed and waned and, and others you know, have become really and have had dramatic effects such as white band. And, and this doesn't even, obviously, 2004 doesn't include stony coral tissue loss disease. Now, and here, Gorgonians in this, in this compilation, um, relatively few, small number of the species, and those species that do seem to suffer from some disease, um, it's fewer. So if you say, you know, how many, what proportion of the, of the species, I don't say, should say really the fauna, you know, Two-thirds of scleractinians, call it, you know, I don't know, well, we can be generous and say for one-third. And then in terms of two and a, you know, on average, call it two versus one diseases per, per, per species. So again, the Gorgonians just don't seem to suffer as much from the disease. And those diseases, when they have come through, have not been as dramatic. So on the you know scleractinian side, white band disease, which you know has just totally wiped out huge reef tracks, where you know you, you go for kilometer upon kilometer upon kilometer of a cropper palmata, and 
you know, all gone after white band swept swept through, and you know these huge patches of cervicornis, which again just turn into rubble fields. And then most recently, of course, stony coral tissue loss disease. And so here's this wonderful dendrogyra in St. John in 2017, sort of right on the corner of one of our study sites. And sort of, you know, it's like we came here. You know, so your, your, your friend, your favorite colony that you always love to get in the water and see after it's just like just show up once a year. Um, and then in about 2019, it starts working its way through sites in St. John. And in 2020, we saw it at our, our site and here in 2021, there's just this little bit of tissue left. And when we came back in 2020, actually by the end of that summer, um, it, this was pretty much gone. So, and just to all the dendrogyra at our, our site are gone um, in 2020, in 2022. So obviously sclerotinians, you know, have had these horrible pandemic type diseases. And the only one we know about for octocorals is aspergillosis which appeared and in places it did wipe out, you know, populations. So here you have, you know, these are just the ribs left from, Gor from Gorgonia. Um, but it's still around, but it doesn't seem to be wiping out populations the way it did when it, when it first appeared. And these are uh, data from, uh, from Keo Kim and the and data from the Keys and really the only graph we need. So here's prevalence. So 97, 99, 2001, 2003. And as you can see, he's wide summary prevalence of the disease just was steadily dropping off through this time. So you could go out and find aspergillosis, but it doesn't seem to be having the same dramatic effect. And is that because, you know, the susceptible genotypes have already been wiped out? I mean, I guess that's the presumption. And also the severity of the disease, you know, has the sort of level has leveled off. So again, for whatever reason, be it luck of the draw or not, um, octocorals just don't seem to be as susceptible to the, to the diseases. And then the other piece in here is resilience. And this is, you know, start off by saying at the colony level, octocorals grow fast and can, can take a lot. So this is Antilogorgia elizabethi. And what you see here over this two year span, it's adding 20 centimeters of, of branch tissue. They, they grow fast. And not only do they grow fast, they rep repair fast. So um, Antilogorgia elizabethi is harvested in the Bahamas and because it produces a natural product which the skincare industry uses. And the way the harvesters go about doing it is basically they come up to a colony and they just crop them back, um, anything, you know, something on their scale of 15 centimeters of tissue with maybe half a dozen branches or so. And, and I, for basically for this time period, I was doing a lot of work with, uh, on it with, the, with some of the collectors. And one of the collectors in March 1990 sent, sent me this colony, which when you looked at it closely, you could see, and he said, oh, this is one that I harvested. And I just, we just, I just it, was so, it was so neat. I, I just grabbed the whole thing for you. Basically, you could see where he had cut it and it had come back. So after he had cut it, this is what it looked like. And he had the exact date that he had done, done that. He had been in that area. So September 12, 1997, this is what the colony looks like. March 99, a year and a half later, it's put on all of this growth. So they have this tremendous ability to, to recover this uh, resilience at the colony level. And there's also species level resilience, and I apologize for any PTSD that this uh, generates here. This is this is this is Irma, which I guess wasn't bad for that bad for Puerto Rico. Um, and after it's swept swept through the uh, Virgin Islands, and you know, not surprisingly, the combination of Irma and Maria, and probably on, we were, our work is on the south side of the island, so it probably was Maria that caused most of the damage. Um, not surprising at our sites, which are 25 feet or so deep, um, deep enough that they didn't get totally trashed. If you were up around 15 feet, everything was, was gone. But they all they all took a hit <coughs> um, from 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 the hurricane. Um, so Booby Rock, that's the one with the pretty picture with the dendrogyra. 
which we had start, looked at one year, and then we said, oh, yeah, we better start looking, following that again. So it drops way, way down here. But they're all, you know, something on the scale of 30% drop in numbers, numbers of colonies. But, and this is what, yeah, so here's the, that booby rock site. So there's 2015, here's 2022. Um, still tons of octocorals, but quite clearly not, not, as, not as many. This is not the exact same location. But um, it, did, it did take a bit of a beating. But the, actually, I just go back and do it here. So, you know, there's some ever so slow, little bit of recovery at, at all of these. And what was driving that was so the summer right after the hurricane, hurricane occurs here in um, September 2017, that summer there seemed to have been a little bit of a dip and significant here and not significant at the other sites, a little bit of a dip in recruitment, but then recruitment back, you know, you could even in that case, well, this is just constant recruitment with year to year, some year to year variation. So in other words, recruitment has steadily occurred and we've been following recruitment for quite a while there. And, and uh, basically you always find, you always find recruits. So, that has really driven a, you know, that resilience in numbers. And there's also resilience in terms of a community structure, community composition. So this is a multi-dimensional scaling for these three, for these three sites that we followed. And, you know, so basically the closeness of the dots represent how similar the communities are in terms of percent abundance of the, of the different species. And so basically, hurricane a little bit of an effect a little bit of an effect a bigger effect here at this one site tektite um but in all of them it's not as though it scrambles these communities they're still quite distinctly different in, in what they have both before and after and when you look at this in a, in a different way and perhaps it's initially more confusing fashion what you're looking at here the most uh, abundant uh, species at at um, at, two, at two of the sites, and you know, the size of the bands are showing you how their relative proportions are, are changing. We don't need to go through all of this. For, the point I want to make is here, the largest colonies greater than 60 centimeters in height, you know, there's some pretty big changes going on here, whereas when you look at recruits, or not recruits, but recruits and small colonies, that change is not nearly not nearly as great there is some so again that recruitment is presumably regenerating you know the distinctness of those of those communities so and the last piece in this is you know what i say is, is habitat availability so again you know sclerotinians dot steadily diving throughout the, the 20th century and so here you have this, you know, this big Orbicella fabiolata, which is mostly, you know, there's still some living coral here, but most of it is dead. And what's growing on all of this substrate? Gorgonians. So, you know, the way I sort of characterize that, and I don't have data on, on that per se, is, you know, we think of, you know, here's the historic healthy reef community. They're living Scleractinians, they're, they're Gorgonians scattered around, they're recruits of all these different species. Some disturbance events, called a bleaching event, comes through. Gorgonian survives, stony coral dies, and then there's continued recruitment of the octocorals. Some recruitment, but lesser recruitment of the scleractinians, and you end up voila with, with octocoral forest. And so again, you know, the, really the storyline, as I said, becomes one of resistance and then this combination of resilience plus habitat availability. And whereas I'm completely comfortable in this resistance and resilience story, I have to admit the reefs here have made me sort of go, well, oh, I have to figure out what, what, what's going on here. Because um, the reason we're here is we have, um, we're going back to Paul Yoshioka's old 
transects, which he monitored from 1983 to 2003, and re recensing those. And um, this is site at San Cristobal in, in, in July 1984. Um, this is yesterday in San Cristobal, I think. Yeah. Through the miracle of Photoshop, I can now, you can now see the, see the reef. Um, I, I blew me away when I, when I, when I did this. I was like, oh, I don't remember it looking like that. But the point being is that, um, well, through Paul's study, the numbers were increasing. And I guess what we'll discover, and this is and a lot of this work is uh, Chris, my postdoc Chris Wells' stuff. Um, he was the one who wrangled Paul's data into a, a useful form since we had um, printouts of all of Paul's data for 20 years, <laughs> along with <laughs> KT, who, who typed up a tremendous amount. <laughs> but, um, you know, it looks as though the density, Paul saw a steady increase in density at these sites, which were not scleractinian sites, with scleractinians dying off. And, uh, you know, we'll discover if that number has increased even more so in the last in the last 20 in the last 20 years. And he attributed that to the die off in diadema. So in some ways, maybe this does still become a habitat availability story, because the way what well, Paul's explanation for it was that when diadema was around, it was keeping the algae down and all of the sediment was mobile and therefore there's a lot of scour on these on these reefs. And as soon as diadema disappeared, turf builds up over the entire area and now those sediments are bound and you don't have as much scour and therefore you have recruit, recruit survival. But where then at some point that turf one would think it might interfere with recruitment too. So, you know, there's more to this, more to the story to be figured out. So, is it a new normal? Um, the good, yeah. At the moment, uh, the coral forests appear to be doing just fine. The bad, scleractinians continue to decline. There's not a whole lot left to go, but they still continue to decline. And while you know. Octocorals create three-dimensional structure. They actually create sediment in those, in those, with those sclerites, um, but they don't maintain the physical structure of that reef. And again, we, you know, people talk about the flattening of the reef. Um, and then, of course, the ugly is this uh, graph that came out of, the, out of the New York Times showing greenhouse emissions. And basically, here's at the point where this was done. With, here's the trajectory that would be needed to follow to, to the one and a half degree rise, that is to say this massive reduction in greenhouse emissions. This is what was pledged at the time, and that still gives you over a two degree. The current rate at that point in time, 2.7, and then had you pre-Paris, you know, 3.6. And so, sure, you know, we're already, the, you know, one degree into the one and a half. So I'm willing to say, yeah, if we were to do this, you know, this may, may very well have a new normal, but sort of all bets are off if we, you know, we don't, that is to say, you know, we've, we've gone from here to here, at least in some places, and what's gonna happen here, I think is, is, is an open question, you know, once, once we start going into those higher, higher temperature zones. And to end on a totally pessimistic note, <laughs> the Titanic. <laughs> right, this is the Titanic. And this is, of course, the re re recreation of what it currently looks like. And of course, the you know, well, Ernesto and I both started working on reefs at a time where you thought of reefs is going on for they've been there forever, they're gonna go on forever. Oh, sure, they're bad years and stuff, but you know, they'll they'll keep going on. And boy, were we wrong. Uh, and, you know, the Titanic was supposed to be this unsinkable ship. And there it is. And, you know, I, I, I don't know if any of you know this song, but when I was a kid, so I guess shortly after the sinking of Titanic, this kid's song was created, with, which has gone on for, you know, years. I'm not going to sing the whole thing to you, <laughs> fortunately for you. Uh, but it has... This one line, uh, it was on its maiden trip when an iceberg hit the ship. 
Well, that's wrong. An iceberg did hit the ship. The ship hit the iceberg. And the ship, ship hit the iceberg because of confidence, greed, hubris, which pretty much describes our approach to, to climate change. And so uh, I'd like to think that this is not the metaphor for the world's coral reefs. I can't really guarantee that that's not the case. So with that uplifting thought, <laughs> I should acknowledge a whole bunch of people, the people I'm currently working with. Uh, I might recently finished up a PhD student, Angela Martinez, uh, Chris Wells sitting right here, Pete Edmonds at Cal State uh, Northridge, um, my little very long-term collaborator, Mary Alice Coffrey, I also am married to, um, and then um, some postdocs who've worked with me and really created, helped create some of these ideas in my mind, and then a very small sample of some technicians and grad students who've contributed a bunch to this and then funding mostly from the National Science Foundation, but some from uh, the NOAA NERC program and Sea Grant, and then the stations, which have really provided resources to us over the years. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. So when, when, when you first met uh, Ernesto in Panama, and you guys were highly optimistic, Around what year did it tip over and you start feeling a little pessimistic? So, I'm trying to think. So, there, I was 86. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm trying to remember. So, there was a SICB meeting in, in, in Boston. I want to say it's somewhere in the 90s. And I ended up on a, a panel because there was a section on sort of beta reefs, future reefs that Bob would admire. And, Mostly Bob and I organized, but Bob was really the one who did all the work with that. But we had this sort of press conference where we were in this panel that people were asking questions. And this is about the time, those of you who are familiar with uh, Tommy Garreau, he was beating the drum, it's climate change, it's climate change, it's climate change. And so this is, yeah, 90s, you know, late 90s, I think. And to a person, we were saying, well, in the long run, climate change is going to be important. But right now, what we have to worry about is you know, land use and sedimentation and overfishing and eutrophication. Those are things that are going to do in reefs before climate change really kicks in. Well, we were just wrong. So local stressors first. Yeah, yeah. But because, I mean, you know, and of course now it's like, well, maybe local stress, you know, solving local stressors can slow the process. But no, you're just putting tax in the way of the giant that's trying to walk down the road. Walk down the road. Um, my so yeah, so I think it's yeah the, the last certainly 15 years that it's like yeah you can't you can't stick your head in the ball. <laughs> hey. Hi, nice talk. Um, I have a couple questions. So I'm. Uh, one of the key members for the Puerto Rico Coral Reef Monitoring Program um, here in Puerto Rico. And we have 42 permanent stations. And the stations are coral-dominated habitats, so they're not typically dominated by Gorgonians. What we're seeing is this uh, increase in abundance of not erect Gorgonians, but encrusting Gorgonians like Briarium. Yeah. Um, and some type pretty, I don't know, I would have to but I don't know if it's significant, but in my eyes it is. Um, yeah. So question is, uh, do cyphomas also eat briariums and like what are, what are the predators? I've seen cyphoma on briarium. I've seen it, I've, so I've seen it eating upright. And so, you know, so, I mean, it's sort of interesting because another reason that Gorgonians have not tended to be monitored is because they're upright and you can't do photo you can't do photo quadrats and 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 and, and so so we're we're we're, guilt, we're guilty of the other way around. It's like, oh well encrusting briarium or erythropodium, I can't count colonies because they're just they're just they're, they're just spreading. So we haven't really other than the upright forms of briarium, we haven't included those. But yeah, I mean it's certainly there are places where I've seen exactly that. And cyphoma, I don't, well, I've never looked at 
preferences, but I've never included briarium in that. But I mean, th just thinking in terms of the frequency with which I see it on the reef, I'd say, yeah, they'll eat them, but probably not for fur. Um, I've never noticed one on an erythropodium, which isn't, you know, to say that's not what they what they do. Um, and I and Cyclova certainly contributes to places going, you know, bad. And but you know, it's 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 sort of interesting because I've been describing because Chris is new to Caribbean reefs in the last three years, and I've been describing sort of my view of Cyclona on octocorals, which is, um, you know, this, well, there's a 30, 40 year old paper, which called them fruit and predators, because the octocorals seem to be healing almost as fast as the, but on St. John, what we're seeing is that they're not healing, and therefore the Cyclona are really trashing Trashing some colonies, and, and it was based on our uh, three days of diving here, it was, Chris was saying, "Oh yes, yeah, the way you describe, where you see a cyphoma with a scar, but it's sort of sort of healing." So, under normal <laughs> conditions, I don't think they're really you know, regulating regulating that. So, are there other predators? Uh, Hawksbills will supposedly take a mouthful of them. I've never seen it happen, but I guess stomach contents have shown. shown Blannies. We've seen Blannies. Really? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, actually, no, actually, actually, the most important one is probably uh, fireworms. Yeah, fireworms. Because they'll, I mean, um, well, there's there are two things. One is, of course, what happens when things are a single polyp? And they're, you know, heated on picking away at a big colony. Nothing. Ketodon grabs the two polyps up for the crew and it's and it's gone and fireworms cruising along and you know and fireworms will just just go up and if it's a thin branch it'll just bring you know just bite right through it. If it's a thick branch, they you know it's like a drop or circa cornice where they just digest the tissue off that and they they can see the axis in there. So if you had to pick an, an animal that's doing stuff, I would say actually it's it's fireworms. But it's really hard to quantify. Yeah. We did a story here, uh, Stacy. I don't know if you have it with Matt uh, Luca, uh, looking at cyphoma preferences. Okay. And we did several reasons. Uh, we found 17 different species of Borgonians within. Okay. Remember, it was like right area. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. And then there are two. There have been two events here of um, population explosions of cyphoma. Which have completely, you know, cleaned the reef yeah. of Gorgonian tissues. One was in Mona Island, uh, and the other one was here on the outer reefs. Okay, a few so, so, years back. so yeah. apparently, on the occasion, it can be. Yeah. But I mean, you have Gorgonians with 250 cyphomas of them. It was just unbelievable. It's like a, a Gorgonian of cyphoma. Yeah. So the interesting thing is because there's that pretty file study where they caged fish out of areas. My other question is, is that we're also seeing a degradation of our mesophotic reefs, um, and there is technically habitat available for Borgonians to recruit to, but we're not seeing that transition. So what do you think are the factors of, you know, Borgonians transitioning to deeper reefs? Yeah, well, so, I mean, I, that, that habitat availability story made this really a hypothesis, and actually, we started marking some, you know, recently dead colonies to just try to follow what what happens on there. I think it's a pretty long term long term process, um, you know. And that mound that and you can see it, you know, you go out places where here's a mound which obviously was created by a scleractinian mound covered with hot curls, but I can't I, I can't tell you whether that's you know. It's not five years, it's that might very well be 50 years. Um, so, yeah, in the mesophotic. Just, I mean, obviously, the first question is uh, you know, what sort of settlement, what is settlement rates like in general? Um, you know, our numbers when we have at late south seen, or, you know, we're seeing opticals on them. Um, you see some sclerotinians there too. But obviously, survival of uh, all these little guys is, is, is uh, 
Stacia, you observe in the, uh, the erythropodium and the myelinous uh, disease because they are very susceptible to a couple of diseases that uh, produce high mortality. The last monitoring per period, like uh, the race that have a lot, we didn't, I didn't see any disease okay. from, uh, um, from those. And nope. even just uh, off direct Gorgonians also, like we didn't yeah. see. So Brian and erythropodium will bleach and die. Yeah. Yes. I don't know if they die from the bleach, you know, it's a disease that's killing them at the water. Yeah. Are you looking at any other environmental parameters, like water quality and turbidity, or associating that with variations in Bovarians? So, he actually has some of those data for, for St. John, and um, it's not, it's not very clear correlation of those, but that you know, has really been explored as well as, uh, and, you know, and it actually, you know, diving here and saying, you know, well, we would all have two sites, one of the Luna and one of San Cristobal, and, um, you know, my characterization is uh, the Ida Luna is a cold forest, and San Cristobal is an uncalled jungle. Um, is it, you know, this amazing mountain. The picture that I cleaned up so you can suddenly see the reef, you know, there's a lot of stuff in the water here, and we don't really have it fully psyched out how dependent on the corals are on the particular site. So, they can rely on They probably don't rely on their symbionts as much as it's going to be in the story. Um, so, maybe what's going on here versus the St. John um, is a Water quality, not in terms of the water being bad, but actually food here. Um, don't really know. Ernesto, did you notice anything like with the Quantica surveys? Places that have a lot of Gorgonia? Okay. Yeah, I mean, the major difference was that uh, uh, tumors were much more abundant in the Quantica area compared to the other sites that we did. But otherwise, the Gorgonians will look fine. What do you mean, like or the places with more Gorgonians versus Sclerotinians? Is there variation among the Gorgonica sites? Uh, yeah, the, the, like some of the coastal It just values. seems like some of the ones that are more terrible yeah. have much more. Those are Gorgonian. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you, Clark, because there's Paris, like in Rosuello, Papa Cabarrojo, also Palinas. They're like Gorgonian forests. And those are like the most turbid views. So I do think that there is some association between and, and, and really broad surveys, I think. So I think Mumbi calls them Gorgonian plains is a dominant form. And yeah, so they are, there are places where you just, you know, it's not unique to Puerto Rico. Um, but um, yeah, what that, right. Yeah, yeah they, they tend to be high energy. And, you know, I can create a whole, a whole series of hypotheses, high energy at well, sediment moving, maybe growing upright, get yeah, above that. So even if your base gets a little bit eroded, tissue gets eroded, that's okay. You're living above, living above that, where it's your little square activity and trying to make it getting carried on. Um, but it, yeah, it could relate to quality in terms of their food here, all this water. Well, I mean, water quality, I was thinking, you know, those conditions, yeah. the other, yeah. You know, the other thing, of course, is once you have these structures, then modify all those conditions. You know, how, that, how that promotes settlement, segmentation, <laughs> or modification. I saw that you mentioned the Acropora as a point. I have a little bit of knowledge of uh, Acropora prolifera, which is a hybrid between these two. So, from what I've researched, I have seen that they are more disease resistant and they can uh, spread towards the intertidal zone rather than as a So, would hybrid mutation be? Sort of adaptation mechanism. Uh, for example, the 
the resilience and the resistance that you experience. Uh, what would you, what were your thoughts here? So, I mean, the molecular based systematics of the corals is a step beyond intensity, but it's more sort of, I'll call it the toddler level. Um, so, there's still, and there are, you know, all of these cases of cryptic species or things which are dramatically, dramatically different, being not all not all that difference. And I mean, I think anybody who works on this sort of expects that they're met, that they'll be hybrid stories there, but it's not like somebody has to come up with a, oh, here's this, here's this classic case. So, yeah. I mean, so is that the basis for that overall phenomena? My first thought would be probably not, but we don't know, we don't know enough that that's the categorical yes or no. Thank you for your talk. So, um, so usually here um, you see these uh, forests, these these uh, tokoro plains uh, on, on the shallows, you know. And then I'm not sure you're looking at these transects, right? Um, are you, from your previous experience, are you looking like these grasslands? Is are they increasing their range downward into the reef, or they're maintaining themselves to that specific so, I, area? Do you have any? I, we certainly don't have. Even like just observation, just from yeah, no. I mean, I I like working at thirty feet <laughs> <laughs> because you you do see there is like a clear line yeah. dividing, you know, as you're in the shallows and you see these forests, and then you start seeing the square canyons or sponges, whatever. Yeah. So I mean, and obviously, yeah, and here. And so I mean, I've only heard people talk about the shelf edge here, so I've never you know seen it, so I don't. Yeah. No, but even just here in the shallows, you know, where you guys are doing your surveys, like you, if you go a little bit deeper, you start seeing that there is that edge over yeah. that forest. Is, is it the same slope or does it start? Yeah, yeah. same slope. Yeah. yeah. Even, even in San Cristobal, there's more sclerotinians and sponges, and it's just slightly deeper than yeah. Media Luna, which is yeah. 10 feet yeah. shallow. Yeah. And that's just, that's just pavement as flat as this desk. And oct corals everywhere, and there's more octicals deeper, deeper, but there's also spectrum and sponges. So I don't know how that transitions to yeah. these photos. Yeah, and so this, how much of this is, just comes back to one movement, and obviously this is just that. Yeah, yeah. Based on Monday, St. Christopher, which is basically some of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you see more pockets of sand and we'll call it fine sand. So, for, for what you are describing, uh, Sierra is entirely possible. And I think we have a good uh, idea here where we can uh, observe that those of you that are going to be here in, in 10, 15 years is uh, Media Luna. Uh, Toronto doesn't have that density of Gorgonians in the shallow platform, but Media Luna, we have, you know, 40, 50 meters of a dense forest of, uh, of Gorgonians, and then that stops at the, at the point when the, the uh, slope starts going down, because that was all dominated by the Oricellis. Now the Oricellis are gone, and most of the Oricellis are gone, so there's plenty of uh, yeah. habitat availability now for the Gorgonians to move down, probably, and that's Maybe the future that way. Yeah. You talk probably fit perfectly well, but that's that's not you know the general case for everywhere, probably. Because you know, unlike Turomoti, is different. It doesn't have that, that density of Gorgonians over there. Uh, and then you, if you go to, I mean, from the, the mid shelf reef all the way to the shelf edge, which is you know five six kilometers, it's all, all these you know consolidated platform with spur grooves and some black trees, and that's mostly dominated by Gorgonians, most of the case. Any questions from the you guys, the virtual people? Hello. <laughs> Hello. I have a question. Go ahead. Or is this uh, Dr. Corney? Yep. Hi, Howie. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I think I emailed you during my PhD asking about 
carbonate production and octocorals. Um, so I won't bother you with that question again. But um, I was wondering, the, has anyone done work with like thermal performance curves in octocorals? Are, are they sort of optimized for, for warmer waters? And could that be part of the, the driving trends here? So um, well, actually, Mary Alice has done, looked at the symbiogenesis and looked at growth rates. And, um, and they seem to do pretty darn well with warm, warmer water, but, um, but still a drop off. But it's not, the cultures are not crashing. But in terms of you know, hollow bion performance, it's not. It, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there are some groups doing that, but I'm not aware of it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and my, my follow-up question is sort of relating to, um, we see these trends in the Caribbean, but not so much in the Pacific, um, you know, and there's various hypotheses of regarding, you know, why we see certain things happening in the Caribbean versus the Pacific. Um, you know, some are nutrients, uh, sediment loading that people have discussed. Um, but I'm curious about the role of herbivorous fishes in, in sort of octocorals. I realize you talked a bit about sort of these corollivorous snails, um, things of that nature, but are there or were there fishes that were, you know, once, you know, mowing down these, these octocorals in the Caribbean or do they exist in the Indo-Pacific? I, you know, I don't believe so. I mean, I've never, you know, I've never seen carrot fish take a take a big hunk of branch and chew on it. You know, they're they are loaded with um, novel compounds that the, all the organic chemists love to describe, and then the pharmaceutical people I'm see what they're doing, what, what what cells they will and won't kill. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, actually, next next week. Chris is going to be talking about some experiments that he led, um, looking at, you know, in part what's going on with the turf and recruitment. So that's that's where herbivory probably has a has a role. Um, and you know, but in terms of yeah, schools of octocoral eating fishes, uh, not not the case. Um, but just to jump back to the Pacific, where um, you know, gorgonians or Arborescent Alcinaceans, or however you want to, whatever, however you want to describe them, are not. They're not absent, but they're not particularly abundant. But you have all of these other octocoral species, which, in some habitats, you know, you have sh very shallow water zones that are just absolutely paved with with these things. So um, they're already, you know, since they they're already there and and super important in places. But I I don't. Yeah, I don't think people have talked about uh, wholesale. Although I think you know a couple of those uh, data points in that Norquist uh, Nordstrom paper um, are ones of Asnasians growing over overgrowing areas. So yeah, you have things like xenids and stuff which can really rapidly monopolize space. But yeah, no, it's not the same same sort of story. But you know, it's what we discover here. That's a, you know, every island, every reef seems to be a slightly different story, but because we're working with a much smaller species list, there's a more commonality to it maybe than in the Pacific, but that, you know, we're totally outside of my knowledge on that. Great, great. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Thank you, Howie. Thank you very much. And for those still online, there's going to be another seminar next week by Chris Wells, okay, at the same time. Oh, and Kevin, they're going to do a, uh, a combo, a combo <laughs> seminar. All right, perfect. Okay, same time next week. See you. Let's come in.